So welcome everybody. You are joining a webinar on the launch of the new Access and Success questionnaire, or ASK for short. Um, this is a new questionnaire that was launched this morning, and today we're going to be talking you through what it is, how to use it, and kind of next steps moving forwards. So you will notice that you are muted and your camera is off. If you're unfamiliar with the webinar format on Zoom, don't worry, this is normal. You won't be able to see or hear each other, but you should be able to see and hear me and our two panelists, Lauren and Sonia, who are here with us. Um, in the absence of being able to unmute yourself, you'll see that there's a Q&A or question and answer function at the bottom of your Zoom screen usually. So please do feel free to use that. Um, through the course of the webinar and we'll make sure that we do leave time for lots of questions at the end of today's session as well. Um, so finally, I'll just introduce myself. I am Rain Sherlock. I'm the head of evaluation here at Tezo and I've been working with partners from the Brilliant Club. So Lauren, who you can see on the call and also researchers from the University of Cambridge and we have Sonia on the call to go through a multi-step process to produce and develop the access and success questionnaire. And that's what we'll be spending our time talking through today. For anyone who's joined the call in the last couple of moments, welcome. Um, you will be muted. You won't be able to see or hear each other, but please do note that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and you can use that to ask questions throughout our session today. I think I'll go ahead and get us started. So a brief outline of today's session, um, and then in a moment I'll go ahead and introduce us to Tezo and the ASQ. Um, I'm then going to hand over to Lauren and Sonia, who will talk through an overview of the project process um, and each of the phases or steps that we've been through to get to where we are today on launch day. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking you through in quite practical terms what the different resources and guidance documents are, how you can access them and how they should help and support you to both use the ASQ um, and improve evaluation generally. As I've mentioned, we will make sure we leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So if you think of questions as we're talking in the next 30 minutes or so, feel free to drop them straight into the Q&A box or drop them down and, and make sure you ask them at the end. So for anyone who's not familiar with Tezo, just a very brief introduction, we are an independent hub for education professionals, specifically working in higher education, and we're here to support the sector to provide research toolkits, evaluation guidance, we often partner with different higher education providers on research projects, um, and one key element of Tezo's role is to upskill and capacity build the sector in terms of evaluation. Um, and that very much sits with what we're going to be talking about today in terms of the new validated questionnaire. Tezo are also an independent charity. Um, so we were set up by a consortium of King's College London, Nottingham Trent University and the Behavioural Insights team. But we have now spun out and become an independent charity and have been so for a couple of years. And finally, we're an affiliate What Work Centre. Um, there are about nine of these centres that make up the What Works net Network, um, and that means that we follow the kind of government approach to evidence-informed policy and practice, and that's very much baked in to the work and the tools and guidance that we produce here at TSA. So for anyone who has attended Tezo webinars before, I think this slide is probably becoming increasingly familiar, but I will continue to, to show it. Um, it's a, a screen grab from what we call our MEF, which stands for Monitoring and Evaluation Framework. And our Monitoring and Evaluation Framework at Tezo is the kind of four key steps or stages that we see crucial to any good and rigorous evaluation. And there are many different um, components or elements that make up each step and stage. So what is demonstrated by the kind of circular nature of this diagram is that we see evaluation as reiterative. Um, we go through each of these steps in any evaluation, and then we would kind of spend time after the reflect phase and think about what we might change or iterate before we start the process or the cycle again. So each of these stages should inform the next. So diagnose and theory of change should inform your plan. What are your research questions? what are the different data indicators that you might want to use, and then in turn, inform measure, which is where we're situated today. So broadly within the measure, measure, measure stage of the um, cycle, you would think about things like which data do you want to collect, how are you gonna analyze that data, and how are you gonna evaluate it? And the access and success questionnaire very much sits within that phase. 
So what is survey validation? Why does it matter? What's a validator questionnaire? What's an item? What's an intermediate outcome? Lots of different kind of definitions, questions, um, and it can feel a little bit technical in terms of lo logic. So to kind of cast our minds back a bit, and we were even doing this this morning as a, a Tezo team, we this project was kind of conceptualized or commissioned um, almost two years ago now with a view to filling a gap that we had spotted or that we thought existed within the sector. So we had heard from multiple practitioners, evaluators, delivery staff, stakeholders generally within HE, that there was a real lack of kind of consistency in terms of the different measures or tools that people were using to measure the outcomes that are important to us in both student access and student success work. So perhaps people all wanted to understand things like a student's sense of belonging, but everybody was using slightly different ways to measure sense of belonging and conceptualizing sense of belonging in slightly different ways. Um, there were a number of tools being used. So some people were making their own um, questionnaire items or scales, but these weren't being validated. They were kind of homemade versions of, of scales or items. Others were using validated scales, but tweaking them slightly or changing some of the wording because they weren't exactly relevant to our context within WP in the UK. And all of these things mean that we can't be 100% certain or confident that the quality of the measure or the tool that we were using was giving us the quality of data that we need to really understand the impact that our activities or interventions that are having on these outcomes for students. So that's kind of where the story began and why we wanted to work to develop a set of scales that will make up a questionnaire that can be used widely and consistently across the sector and we can be confident that it's validated and it works. So in terms of um, some kind of key terms or definitions, we focused on intermediate outcomes as part of the ASQ. So each of the scales that are included in the questionnaire covers a different intermediate outcome. And an intermediate outcome is really a proxy measure or a kind of middle stepping stone outcome that helps us understand how our program is working on the journey to a longer term outcome like attainment or entry to higher education or even later student success once at higher education mm -hmm. and throughout the higher education experience. It's worth noting that the validation process um, or the process of validating survey scales is not exclusive to intermediate outcomes. It can be used for a whole range of short, intermediate and long-term outcomes, but we have focused on intermediate outcomes as we thought that was where the most value would be for the sector at this exact moment in, in time. Um, what is a validated scale then? A validated scale is basically just a set of questions, or we often will refer to them as items, but if you hear the word items in the next hour or so, we just mean individual kind of questions within a scale. Um, and it's a set of questions that means that, that have been through a kind of multi-step validation process that means we can be confident that they are all measuring the same underlying construct or outcome. So if we're, we've talked about sense of belonging a little bit, if we're trying to understand student sense of belonging, we might have three or four items or questions, each of which track back to sense of belonging, which is the underlying construct that we're interested in or outcome. Um, so that's a validated scale. What's a validated questionnaire? It's basically a, a, a survey with a bunch of different scales. So the access and success questionnaire is the overall tool. And within that, we have seven different scales, questionnaire scales, all of which are validated that you can use. So that's a bit of a story time and, and long background, but let's get started and straight into what I'm sure everybody is most interested in, which is what does the access and success questionnaire currently look like? And we're actually gonna kick off with a, a little video. Give this a second to load. Across the UK, widening participation practitioners are working to evaluate the impact of their higher education access and success activities. TESO's Access and Success Questionnaire, also referred to as the ASK, is designed to support these evaluation efforts by providing validated measures for outcomes that are associated with progression to and success in higher education. 
The questionnaire includes outcomes that have been chosen based on the best available research evidence and have been informed by what practitioners have told us are the types of outcomes that are relevant to their ongoing activities, such as academic self-efficacy, metacognition, and sense of belonging. The questionnaire scales in the Access and Success Questionnaire have all undergone a rigorous process of validation. This means we can be confident that the scales genuinely measure the intended outcome, and they do so reliably and consistently. Crucially, we have also taken the time to collect and analyze data from higher education providers and other widening access organizations. To ensure the outcomes measured by the Access and Success Questionnaire scales are associated with other higher education outcomes. We've also asked for learners' views on the scales and collected feedback from the sector to ensure the scales are suitable for as many respondents as possible. This has resulted in the development of seven validated questionnaire scales that can be used to evaluate higher education access and success programs and activities. There are five scales for outcomes relevant to improving access to higher education. Academic self-efficacy, cognitive strategies, higher education expectations, knowledge of higher education, sense of belonging. These scales can be used with learners as young as 11 and across secondary schools. And there are two scales of outcomes relevant to improving student success once a student is in higher education. Metacognitive strategies, sense of belonging, these scales can be used with students in higher education. The Cognitive Strategies Scale can also be used with students in higher education. The ASK will support the evaluation of your access and success provision. Visit teso.org.uk to find out more about how to use these scales in practice. You don't need to visit Teso right now because we are here and we'll tell you about it. Um, so what you can see on screen now are the seven scales included in the Access and Success Questionnaire. So as the, the video briefly explained, we have four scales that are suitable for use in student access work. So that's before a student enters higher education pre-entry. And they are the four first scales on this table. So academic self-efficacy, higher education expectations, knowledge of higher education and sense of belonging specific pre-entry measure. There is then one scale that can be used for both pre-entry and post-entry work. So that's student access and student success, and that's cognitive strategies. So that is suitable for learners, both pre-entry and post-entry to higher education. And then finally, we have two scales that are suitable for use only with learners um, already within higher education or studying at university in higher education. And those two scales are metacognitive strategies and sense of belonging again, but a different scale because this is now relevant to whether or not a student feels like they belong once they're at higher education, not what they expect once they get there. There are a couple of things that I want to just pause and note here. So the first of those is that we have dropped one scale that appeared in the partially validated WP questionnaire that was launched at a very similar time last year. So I'm sure many of you on the call were aware of that partially validated scale. We had an enormous amount of support and help from the sector in collecting data using that partially validated questionnaire. Um, and we use that pilot data to complete the validation process. And what we found when analyzing that pilot data is that one scale, which was critical engagement with information, did not perform to a satisfactory standard for us to be able to confidently use it as a scale that we know will collect the, the kind of quality of data we need to, to be able to measure um, critical engagement with information or critical thinking. So it, in very um, broad terms, what that means is that the internal consistency and the reliability of the items within the critical engagement with information scale didn't reach the threshold for statistical analysis or rigor that we were confident to be able to maintain the scale. So we basically dropped that one scale and that's the main difference that you will note between the partially validated version and this access and success questionnaire that we're launching today. 
There are a couple of other changes. You'll notice small tweaks to words or the ordering of words. You'll notice that we've updated and included additional prompts, um, but that's the only scale that is different between the two versions. The other thing that I want to pause and note here is the distinction between cognitive strategies and metacognitive strategies. So you can see on the slide that there are two separate constructs, two separate outcomes, and two separate scales in the ASQ, and that cognitive strategies is suitable for use with younger learners, pre-entry to higher education, as well as post-entry, while metacognitive strategies is only suitable for learners post-entry. And I think the best way to explain this here is that there is quite a lot of overlap or similarity between the two outcomes and indeed between the two constructs. And one way to think of it is that metacognitive strategies is a overarching umbrella term and that cognitive, cognitive strategies sits beneath metacognitive strategies. But to give a more kind of practical explanation of what that means, when we think of cognitive strategies, so suitable for use with younger learners, what we're really trying to understand through the scale is the extent to which these learners use effective cognitive strategies. So how do they implement um, and use different ways of thinking, ways of learning in their day-to-day -day educational experience? Metacognitive strategies, on the other hand, helps us understand or measure the ways in which learners monitor and adapt their own learning in different contexts. So the clue is really in the name in, a, in that it's it's more meta, it's high level, and they're able to think about learning. Whereas cognitive strategies is just the strategies that a student uses to learn or engage with their studies. Um, so they are different, they measure different things, but they're very much both under the umbrella of metacognitive strategies and cognitive strategies is a, a kind of precursor to metacognition. So metacognition is quite a complex and multifaceted construct. And for a student to successfully be able to achieve metacognitive learning or metacognitive strategies, they would usually have had to kind of mastered or understood cognitive strategies as well. It is a little complex, so I'm going to leave it there for now, but I'm sure we can pick that up in the Q&A. If anyone has a really specific question or doesn't quite understand the distinction, let's, let's just unpack it and discuss it more later. I also wanted to take a moment to unpack the scales and the groups they can be used for in a little bit more detail. So the first thing to note is that, as you can see from, from the current slide, each of the scales are quite short. They have been designed and validated to be user-friendly, easy to implement, and simple for learners to engage with. So the longest scale is metacognitive strategies, um, and this scale still only has five items. That's five questions. So none of these scales are long, complex scales with 10 plus items or questions that students need to engage with. They have all purposely been validated to be simple and straightforward while still being able to accurately measure the construct or outcome that we're interested in. Um, and then I wanted to just get into the age groups a little bit more. So we've talked about the fact that there's some scales that are suitable for pre-entry, some post-entry, and then that one scale, cognitive strategies that can be used both pre and post-entry. But very specifically, academic self-efficacy, higher education expectations, knowledge of higher education, sense of belonging, and cognitive strategies can all be used with learners from year seven to year 13. So that's learners as young as 11 years old, typically in year seven. We have also provided additional prompts in the full version of the ASQ, which you can now access on the Tezo website. And some of those prompts are, so, sorry, some of those scales contain alternative prompts that are specifically designed to engage younger learners. So if you're working with a year seven, eight, or even nine group of students, we have, provided an additional set of prompts that will help the learner be able to kind of read, understand, comprehend, and answer the scale. Um, so in terms of post-HG or post-entry then, what we have is three scales, so cognitive strategies again, as well as metacognitive strategies and sense of belonging that can be used with learners or students who are at higher education. And it's really important to know here that metacognitive strategies and the post-entry sense of belonging measure will not be suitable or won't work with younger learners. So students who have not yet entered higher education are still in kind of secondary school or college. Um, 
And then the other thing I wanted to know is that each of the seven scales follows the same response format. So it is a series of items between one and five items, as you can see on the slide. And then students simply respond to each of these items on a five point Likert scale. So that's strongly agree to strongly disagree. And it's the same response items for each scale. So how do I use the ASQ in practical terms? Um, there are four key steps for thinking about what you do when you leave, leave this webinar. How do you pick it up, use it, implement it, and how can it kind of help and assist you in your evaluation? So the first thing to think about is um, it really starts with theory of change. So the TESO monitoring and evaluation framework that we looked at a couple of slides ago talks you through, e through each of those four stages. So plan, diagnose, measure, reflect. And really you should be starting with a theory of change to understand the overall kind of strategic direction of the intervention or program that you're delivering and trying to work with. So what are the inputs? What are the specific activities? Is it a tutoring program? Is it a campus visit? And then what are the kind of short, intermediate and long term outcomes that you would like that activity or program to achieve? And before you even begin to think about measurement scales, measurement tools, collecting data, you should try and kind of think about that, um, the, the kind of mechanisms that are at play in that theory of change and how you expect that change to occur. One thing to note here is that Tezo recently published something called a Mapping Outcomes and Activities Tool, or MOAT for short, and that tool does help you list, or it lists a number of kind of um, high-level activities and then sub-activities that might exist within those high-level activities, and it then also um, suggests or maps to certain outcomes that link to or, or are relevant to each of those activities. So it's worth checking that out in this kind of step one, identify your program, identify the outcomes. Step two then is to design the evaluation. Um, so you need to think about the type of evidence or the type of information that you're trying to understand through your evaluation activity. It's worth noting that validated scales generally and also the access and success questionnaire are really useful for generating type two and type three evidence. So that's where type two evidence is um, empirical inquiry or empirical evidence and type three is typically causal. So understanding cause and effect. Um, so for example, you might use the access and, access and success questionnaire to start just abbreviating it to ask um, in a kind of pre and post test design using the validated scales. Step three then is to identify the relevant validated scales that you'd like to use in your evaluation. So you should specify in your protocol or in your evaluation plan exactly which scale you want to use. You should try and name that scale. You should think about how you'll collect the data. Will this be administered online via a survey platform? Will it be administered using a paper-based questionnaire or survey tool? Who will you give it to? What year are they in? At what point in your evaluation will you collect the data? So this is all about planning your kind of protocol or high level evaluation plan and identifying the very specific scales you want to use and it's very possible that the scales within the access and success questionnaire will be part of that and that's, that's one place that you can implement it and embed it. The fourth step here is then to just carry out the evaluation um, so as you would usually you, you implement the questionnaire items as part of a kind of online or paper-based survey you collect the data you compile that data in a spreadsheet and then you begin to analyze and look at your data interpret the results and understand what the kind of distance traveled or impact might be um, we'll talk about each of the resources that are available as part of the launch of the ASQ towards the end of this webinar, but it's worth noting that the four steps that we've just been through are very much covered um, in detail in one of the user guidance documents, so we'll come back to that in a moment. But before we do, hopefully we've given you a good introduction into kind of what the scale is, what the items are, who they can be used with. We'd now like to spend a little bit of time talking you through how we got here. So what are each of the kind of phases and steps that we've been through to get to today? And I'm going to initially hand over to Lauren. Thanks, Raineen, and morning, everybody. Um, so what uh, Song and I are going to do is we're going to talk you through the survey validation project and really give you an overview of the process in, in phases we went through and which underpin the access and success questionnaire. So this is essentially the, the magic behind the ASQ. Just to begin with, to introduce the project team, 
Um, so we, so the Brilliant Plan, collaborated with researchers from the University of Cambridge. Um, so my colleague Hannah was involved, um, and we worked with, of course, Sonia, and then also her colleague Constantine. Uh, we, just in terms of the time frame of, of the project in, in the collaboration with Taste, so this was an 18-month project. Um, this is quite typical of validation projects. So typically, to undertake um, a validation process, it takes between 18 months to two years. Um, and this is because of all of the different um, stages and, and phases that you see in front of you. And so what we're going to do between me and Sonia is just give you a brief overview and a whistle-stop tour. Um, so the first phase is consultation and review. And this, um, in many ways, is the most important phase because it's when we're making decisions about the outcomes that we're including in the scales. Um, and so this has to be informed by the evidence um, and also by stakeholders' views um, and also their needs. And so the first thing we did was we did um, an evidence review and we looked at a wide range of intermediate outcomes, um, so social, cognitive, emotional outcomes um, that are linked to progression. Um, oh, sorry, it's jump, jumping around a little bit there. Um, we can just move and move back a couple. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so yes, we did a review of 15 outcomes that I linked with progression to uh, to university and also success at university. Uh, one of the key factors we were looking at in relation to this was to do with attainment, because we know that attainment is a key factor in progression to university. Um, and then we, we put together a rapid review, which is published on TASO's website. And the next slide, thank you. Okay, so this is just kind of giving a very brief overview of some of the evidence. Um, and what we've done is we sort of focused on the seven outcomes that we cover in the access and success questionnaire. And we've just given very, very high level sort of research and the evidence behind it. And just to, just to kind of draw out a couple of examples here. So we know that academic self-advocacy is really strongly um, associated with academic achievement. And so we know academic self-advocacy is a particularly important intermediate outcome. We, we then did things like sense of belonging. So looking at it both pre-entry, but also post-entry as well. And so, in particular, looking at it from, uh, from a pre-entry perspective, we know that attitudes and beliefs around fitting in the university is particularly important when students are preparing to go to university and make that transition. And then we also know when students are at university, um, success in terms of completing the, uh, the university studies and also um, achieving a good degree outcome is very strongly associated with their sense of belonging with the institution. We then look at cognitive and metacognitive strategies, which was also spoken about earlier. And so we know that cognitive and metacognitive strategies are very, uh, very strongly and very closely associated with raising attainment. And so this, this is again when we know that linking connection to attainment is particularly important. And then looking at knowledge of higher education and, and higher education expectations. This, these sort of outcomes are a little bit more complex overall. And we know that a range of factors are, are contributing towards them. We also know that practically these are often outcomes that are focused not on within access interventions. And so again, this is also featured in the review and featured in the final question. And then next slide. <coughs> Okay, so just just sort of talk through the, some of the key consultation findings. And so we, we undertook a consultation in spring 2022. Um, and we, we sent a question a question out to the whole sector. And then we got responses from 44 uh, widening participation practitioners. In particular, we asked them to rank these seven intermediate outcomes in terms of importance uh, for the work they do in relation to access and student success work. It's sort of interesting what we see is that the majority of, of practitioners that we surveyed uh, said that higher education aspirations and expectations weren't most important. And then least important at the bottom was meta -cognitive. And then you can also see that in terms of the inverted triangle as well. And so aspirations and expectations have been viewed as most important. 
and then metacognition as an Eastern Borsuit. And then we just move on to the next slide. And then another question we asked within the survey was around people's confidence in terms of measuring these different types of outcomes. It's interesting what we see here is that practitioners reported being most confident in measuring um, measuring things like sense of belonging, aging, aspirations, and expectations. And then least, uh, least confident at measuring metacognition. And so again, we, if we sort of think about the relationship between outcomes and measures, we are we're seeing an interesting connection between the out outcomes that people are focusing on are things that they feel confident measuring, which which makes perfect sense, and then outcomes that stakeholders are less confident measuring um, that they are prioritising is less important overall. And so again, uh, really this is emphasising the gap between outcomes and between kind of the available measures, and then we click. But we, so alongside the survey, we also did a number of focus groups with practitioners from, from across the sector. Um, and these are really the, the kind of the, the key findings. And so in terms of the evaluation practice, we, we see what we expected in terms of practitioners are using a range of pre-designed questionnaires, um, but there were concerns about whether they were appropriate for the, for the interventions for the target groups. And in that, um, there were also practitioners who were designing their own questionnaires. And again, this really, this really sort of corroborated um, what we kind of thought at the, the beginning of the project and, and ultimately the reason for the project is that there are some concerns over the suitability of the measures available. And then again, the, the bit around kind of the need for, the need in terms of support was really around the measurement of um, outcomes such as metacognition, for example, in study strategies. And so again, uh, with that, we, we see these types of outcomes not being prioritized, it really isn't because practitioners don't consider them to be important. I think overall, they, they consider them to be very important, but it was really more around the availability of measures and suitable scales. And then we just click on one more. Okay, so just to give a bit of um, a wrap up from the initial phase, we, so from the rapid review and the consultation, we then went forward with these seven outcomes overall. And then we, we took these through a series of um, validation steps, uh, which Sonia is going to talk through in a few moments. And then the, the sort of decision-making, the rationale behind these outcomes, really in the very heart of it, we were led by the evidence base. And so led, led by the evidence base, about the connection of these intermediate outcomes to access in student success outcomes overall. And then we were also informed by, by the sector and by stakeholders and, and practitioners and sort of researchers working in the space in terms of what are the outcomes that really matter to them within, within the work they're doing. And then the other kind of bit is making sure that the outcomes we're choosing are likely to be able to shift within an intervention. And so really sort of making sure they are malleable within the time frame and within the type of interventions um, that we're running as access and student success practitioners. Um, and on that note, to Sonia, you will talk through some of the validation work in more detail. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, so the Conclusion of these first few phases of the work where we looked at the existing evidence and then also uh, listened to the sector was the development of this, the scales that Lauren just mentioned, an, an early version of these scales, I should say, each with their constituent items, that is the question statements making up each scale. And once we had this, what we want to call a short list or a long list of items, the first thing that we did was go to learners and specifically undertook, we could go to the next slide, um, a, a, a process of, of, of started a process of validation whose aim was to understand this clarity and ease of answering items by specific learners. We then looked at a variety of different statistical approaches to understand the item functioning and the scale functioning 
within uh, the, the, the kinds of populations that these skills were likely to be deployed with across the sector, looking within that at uh, the extent to which they, the skills themselves worked as well for uh, learners of different ages, of different backgrounds, again, relevant to access and success work, and also thinking about how these scales and the intermediate outcomes they measure may be associated with external measures here of attainment, but in wider validation work uh, that um, uh, can, can relate to other measures as well. And across all of this, and, and what I'll be kind of talking about in, in the next kind of two minutes or so, we made a series of decisions around the scales, around the constituent items of each scale, down to specific wording. And I do really mean word item and word specific decisions. Um, driven by a combination of all of the evidence as this became available over the course of the last 18 months or so, uh, listening both to the wider sector and to the learners and to uh, the statistical evidence coming from collected data. So to guide you through the multi-step process, the first thing that we did was to kind of identify and define the outcomes. And this is where the, the, the work that, that Lauren just outlined um, helped and, and helped quite substantially by drawing on that combination of the sector consultation and the um, and the evidence review. The second step was then to essential, uh, assemble this long list of scales. Um, and as, as I said, the first thing that that we did having now assembled this long list of scales and items was to go to the learners. And actually what that looked like was a process of cognitive testing um, where we presented a, a, a range of learners um, in a first step, and I'll say a bit more in a second, um, in uh, schools, colleges, and in higher education with the scales and asked, and the items, of course, and asked for their feedback. And we genuinely wanted to understand whether specific words made sense to them, whether the prompts were clear, whether the response options allowed them to to answer the questions easily and straightforwardly. Across all of this, we were mindful of the reading age of the items. We were mindful of the burden on participants to any evaluation work that we do alongside our provision within a, a, an access or success space. Once we found out what the learner said, we went back and revised the scales on, on um, the basis of, of that feedback. We also listened to what practitioners in higher education uh, and um, access and success spaces were telling us uh, around these skills, including the people who were involved in supporting us set up that cognitive testing in the first place. And so we collected data and analyzed data on, uh, uh, on these skills, deploying them in a way that they would be deployed when the ASQ would eventually become reality. As part of that, we were extremely lucky to have access to data from the Brilliant Club that related to some, but not all, of the scales that we initially tested. So we worked with data from roughly 23,000 learners collected over a period of three years to understand things like um, item behavior within uh, repeated factor analyses to look at the relationship between items and how they worked together or independently of each other and if those relationships were as predicted given the conceptual underpinnings for each respective scale. We looked at internal consistency or reliability or convex alpha if you are so um, uh, inclined to, to, to look at that. Um, and we also looked at uh, a lot of subgroup analyses. We then wanted, again, uh, use the information from, from that data analysis to make tiny tweaks around uh, the, the scales and redeploy them in two additional surveys. Now, these were smaller. The, well, actually, it should be three additional surveys. The first one dealt with or, uh, achieved responses from about 386 uh, respondents, and these were uh, young people aged 16 to 22, some of them in education, but some of them not in education. And we deliberately took that step to reach out to learners or to young people who were not 
in education. We collected data on, on, on these skills. We then launched two additional surveys, one with learners um, in six forms and one with learners in higher education, testing further iterations of these skills and some of these skills as the evidence built and as over time we understood whether certain items didn't work, whether even small word tweaks might result in different answers and different understandings of, of, of those words. And this takes us to about November 2022 when TESO launched a partially validated questionnaire that uh, was then put out to the sector. And we are extremely grateful to the 13 plus higher education providers um, and to the higher education access tracker HEAT for engaging with the, with the data and actually using the, the, the partially validated questionnaire as it was then to deploy it in, in their usual um, evaluation work of both access and success work. Across all of these institutions, data from just over 3,000 learners was collected. And we analyzed this data again in a similar process as before, going through a number of statistical procedures to understand how scales came together, how the items worked together, whether we were seeing different functioning of these items and the scales for learners from different backgrounds and in different groups. Again, thinking about the practical uh, deployment of scales within the ASQ in the wider higher education sector. We took that um, uh, uh, that statistical analysis and set it alongside everything else, and also set it alongside feedback that we collected in a number of uh, more informal consultative discussions with higher education practitioners, and I do mean across both the access and success space, uh, providing feedback about what worked, what didn't work in normal uh, deployment, uh, and and. At the end of this process, which, as both Lauren and Rain have indicated, has taken a, a substantial amount of time, we arrived at a set of scales, each with constituent items, each with a specific prompt, with prompts that target younger learners, which is what the sector consistently said was um, of increasing importance and therefore uh, needed to be uh, explicitly addressed within this. And those scales and the one item uh, that we have around higher education expectations have, as a result of all of this, come to make up um, the, uh, the ASQ. Now, if you are interested in some of the more technical, even more technical detail behind this process of validation, we will be producing a full technical report um, that outlines all of these steps and outlines all of all of the uh, the points I mentioned here with a lot of detail, including all of the analytical detail for the uh, purposes of, of transparency and replicability, really. The final point that I want to make is that while this process is multi-stage and long, it doesn't mean that it's not doable outside the, the confines of this specifically commissioned uh, piece of work. And in fact, there is work to for um, well towards working towards validating scales that has already existed, work that predates this uh, project specifically in the higher education context. Uh, in the UK and work that has started and completed since we started. And I think that is an, a really exciting place to be, um, speaking as someone who's interested in measurement from an academic perspective, but also from a practical perspective. And the, uh, the, the type of resources that Rain is going to mention in a couple of minutes include a uh, short practical guide to validation so that um, Everyone across the sector may, if so relevant to you, build on, on this and build on the efforts of other colleagues who are working on validating a variety of measures relevant to, to their work, uh, generating uh, scales that sit alongside the ASQ. I think that is therefore my cue to pass back to Rain, uh, who will take us through some of the details around what other guidance um, exists. Super, thank you. 
So everything that Sonia has just explained brings us pretty much to today, which is the, the launch of the kind of final scales and of the ASQ. So um, everything that we have talked through on the slides today is also covered in a series of documentation, web pages and additional resources. To give you a quick um, walkthrough of what they are, the first is obviously each of the scales. So just to put these up on screen again, we have seven validated scales. Um, each of which is included in and makes up the Access and Success Questionnaire, or the ASK for short. And you can now access these scales, the prompts, the information about the age groups for which they're relevant, the items and the response options on the TESO websites, um, and also in a downloadable Word document that you can then take away and use in your own context and work. So the seven scales that we've covered and that will be included are academic self-efficacy, higher education expectations, knowledge of higher education, sense of belonging pre-entry, then cognitive strategies, metacognition and sense of belonging post-entry, seven separate scales. In terms of the surrounding documentation and resources then, so the first is just the, the word version of those scales. Um, the reason we publish it or provide it in a word version is that we appreciate that many people will be using it to embed or update their own existing data collection methodology so you might use poll tricks or smart survey or another kind of online survey platform and you can just copy and paste the items into your online survey platform but you may also use paper-based surveys and you can again just copy and paste the scales from the word document into whatever format you're using so it should be super accessible and easy in a practical sense to use and implement we then have a document that details the specific validation process that we've been through for the ASQ, for the Access and Success Questionnaire, and that talks about um, the kind of consultation process, how many stakeholders we engage with, each of the data collection rounds that Sonia has outlined nicely, um, and just provides a kind of overview of exactly the steps and stages we've been through for anyone who's interested or wants to help colleagues understand the process of validating and developing um, scales or questionnaires. And then the third document um, that directly accompanies the ASQ is a very practical user guidance. So I talked you through kind of four steps to implementing the ASQ a little bit earlier. And this document does that, um, but with even more detail and very useful links to the rapid evidence review and the validation process and everything just contained in one place. The other thing to note is that as part of this um, user guidance for implementing the ASQ, we have developed a spreadsheet that will allow you to collate the data that you collect using each of the scales that make up the ASQ. So you'll still need to collect that data in your own format, be that online or through a paper-based questionnaire, but then you can compile your data into this pre-prepared spreadsheet. And that spreadsheet, without getting super technical, it already has the formulas embedded that will give you the factor for each of the scales. So it will give you a kind of final score for each student with each of the scales or whichever scales you end up using with your students. Um, so it's there to aid and assist you if it doesn't work and you know what you're doing and you have your own way, that's also fine. Um, but it might be a nice place to start for, for people who are just using these scales um, or similar scales for the first time. Two other documents that I want to just reference. So this is, um, a little bit broader, I guess. These documents are about the kind of evidence more generally, about the validation process more generally. And we've talked about both quite a lot already today. But the first is the what we call rapid evidence review. So this covers a, a long list of intermediate outcomes and the very specific um, links or associations between those intermediate outcomes and longer term outcomes like attainment or entry to higher education. Um, so there are 15 outcomes included in this rapid evidence review and a bunch of scales that exist from not just the UK, but the US and other European countries um, that you can kind of use from and draw on if you're trying to measure something that's not included in the access and success questionnaire. And then the final document Sonia just mentioned is a brief um, user guidance for validating your own questionnaire scales. So it's quite a practical approach to each of the phases and steps that you would need to go through if you wanted to do similar work. Um, I'm sure we'll, this will come up in the q a in a moment but it's worth noting that we don't recommend everybody just goes off and starts validating their own scales the message is certainly that validation work is good and we should all be using validated scales but 
it's much easier, believe me, to use one that already exists than than go away and try to to make a bunch of bespoke scales. It does take a long time. It's taken us eighteen plus months. Um, it's great when when it's kind of really necessary and we've got the time and resource and skill to be able to do that. But where possible, do you use a validated scale? Um, and if not, think about how to create one. There are a couple of other resources I want to signpost to quickly because we cover seven scales in the ASQ or the ASK, um, but it's very possible that you're measuring outcomes that don't exist in the ASQ. Um, so a few places that you might be able to look or find useful. The first is the EEF stands for the Education Endowment Foundation. They have something called the Spectrum Database, which is a database, unsurprisingly, with a long list of scales and items that are used to measure or measurement tools for outcomes relevant to the education space. So not all of them are specifically validated in the UK in our context. Many of them are from the US or other European countries. Um, but there is a really comprehensive list of the different tools and scales that exist. And I definitely recommend at least starting there and kind of having a look around once you've got your theory of change and the list of outcomes that you're interested in. The other tool that's more um, newly been introduced to the higher education sector is something called the TAPE, the Toolkit for Access and Participation Evaluation. Um, and this is a Word document that you can kind of download and access that details a bunch of scales with items not dissimilar to the ASQ that have been validated for use in higher education in the UK. And the, the tape covers outcomes or constructs like confidence, knowledge of higher education. So again, if you find that the seven scales included in the ASQ um, don't cover the outcomes that you're interested in, I do recommend checking out other additional resources and both the Spectrum database and TAPE are really good places to start. We will move on to the Q&A shortly, but before we do so, I do just want to pause and um, acknowledge and um, kind of reference the different resources and and opinions that have gone into helping us develop the ASQ. So the first thing to note is that there are a number of scales that we base the ASQ items and subscales on. So um, in that first stage, when you kind of identify a long list of outcomes and a long list of, a long list of existing scales, um, these are the scales that we started with and we have based a lot of the work that we've done on these scales, although they now do look quite different in, in our specific context. Also a couple of acknowledgements. So a lot of providers and individuals within the higher education sector have contributed to this work, both in phase one through the consultation. So lots of people responded to our survey, took part in focus groups and interviews. We've also had lots of informal conversations of people who are interested and got in touch. And it's been a real um, kind of like intellectually curious experience of just speaking to like-minded people who are trying to do similar work. So a huge thanks to everyone who has taken part in that. And again, to all of the providers that collected data using the partially validated um, questionnaire last autumn, that data was invaluable for us to be able to do the final stage of the validation process and get to the seven scales that we have. So a big thank you to everyone who piloted the scales. And then finally, a real acknowledgement to HEAT, the Higher Education Access Tracker, who have embedded the ASK, the ASQ, and the seven scales in their survey platform. And you can now use the ASQ scales through HEAT. So a big thank you to them as well. Okay, I think we've got a bunch of questions already trickling in. So let's, let's pause there and take um, questions. We've got 30 minutes or so. So I will try to group questions where I can and, and hopefully get to everyone's. Um, if we don't get to your question today, do get in touch. We Two things to know. One, you can email us at info at Tezo if we weren't able to get to your question or if you think of a really important question after the launch. The second thing to note is that we are going to release an FAQs frequently asked questions document and we'll publish that on the Tezo website that will mop up a lot of the questions asked today as well. Um, so let's get started. So the first question we have um, is from Helen Bowman at the Lifelong Learning Center. And they work a lot with mature students. And Helen is asking, please could you let us know if any of the scales have been validated with mature students? Sonia, I'm gonna ping that question to you. 
Sure, thank you, Ren, and thank you so much, Helen, for the question. It's a really good one. Because um, as I was saying earlier, while we heard, of course, there was a lot of interest from the wider sector around increasingly younger learners, we were also very keen to include um, um, learners of ages that are slightly older than, than your sort of usual 16, 18 year old, where in the past, uh, a lot of access work had focused. Now, um, what we the oldest age that we have specifically in our data is 23 to 24. So in that sense, we have not done an explicit separate piece of validation work with mature learners. But what we have seen uh, looking across the totality of the data that I outlined earlier is that the, the how scales work, the quality of the scale, if you if you so want to call it, uh, the scales get slightly better as um, individual respondents get older. And that's because the cognitive load decreases. That's because they will have had simply more time to become more familiar and more aware of what these terms are, or maybe have had more experience as being exposed to different um, stages. And we've also seen in one of the surveys in particular that um, we have some evidence that the scales don't work disproportionately worse for, for young people outside of education. So while I can't say we looked specifically at mature learners, all of the evidence points to these scales working for older uh, learners and for young people who might be considering coming back into uh, higher education. Super, thank you, Sonia. And while I have you, I, another question I wanted to ask you. So um, we've got an anonymous attendee asking, is it possible for a small college to use the questionnaire to measure student learning more generally and find out if any students might be at risk of, for instance, not feeling like they belong? So that's a really interesting question. And I suppose I'd, you know, I'd, I'd welcome a conversation with the person asking this probably offline, um, because it depends what they mean by uh, learning more generally. If we're thinking about, uh, you know, does do the skills and the ISQ capture attainment? Not directly. Um, that That's the point of assessments and tests and exams. Um, however we might feel about them. The, the ASQ scales, however, can be used and should be used to understand the levels at which uh, uh, individual respondents, learners, young people find themselves at a given point. Now, we are interested in that, in th this context today, um, in, in, in the sort of framework of evaluation, trying to understand how those levels uh, uh, um, at, on each respective relevant scale change potentially as a result of us deploying an access or a success initiative. But if you are interested in simply understanding descriptively, exploratorily, um, what happens, I, I would say that, yes, that is absolutely possible uh, to do in the same way that you would use any other scale in the wider literature that has been validated with the right population for the right age. Super, thank you. So we've got a bunch of questions. I'm going to try and we've got a lot of questions. I'm going to try and group a couple of things. Um, there were two or three questions about whether or not we're planning to design and validate new scales for primary school learners specifically. Um, linked to that, there was a question around whether or not we plan to design and validate scales for tracking employment outcomes. So pay post HE into employment. And then also another question about further validation work specifically with cohorts of mature learners. Um, all of these questions are getting at one kind of key thing, which is what's next? What else could we validate? Are there additional outcomes that we want to consider and look at? Um, and I can I can speak to that, but do feel free to jump in, Lauren and Sonia, if you'd like to. So in terms of uh, immediate concrete plans, Tezo are not planning to conduct an additional survey validation project in the kind of near future. We do have a portfolio of research projects set for the foreseeable future. Um, however, one thing I would note is that since... Well, since beginning to think about this work over two years ago, and then since actually doing this project in the last two years or so, we have seen a huge increase in the kind of interest of, of validation work, but also the number of people conducting validation work across the sector. So the tape that we've mentioned um, is led by someone called Matt Horton at, at um, Wolverhampton. 
We also have colleagues at King's College London who are conducting some work on validation and developing questionnaire scales. So I, I see a big kind of uptick, uptick or increase um, in this kind of work happening across the sector. And I, I think um, possibly something to think about is how do we create a kind of network or mobilize that knowledge and work that's happening across the sector and make it more visible so that the scales that are produced are available for use. But to very specifically answer the question, we will not be conducting immediate work to produce scales suitable for primary learners um, or scales suitable for tracking employment outcomes. We then have a couple of questions. Again, I'm gonna group them on analysis. So Sonia, I'm gonna come back to you if that's okay. Um, just flicking through them. So one question was about um, how to treat the data that comes from the scale. So should we see this as continuous data or should we, um, what kind of analysis would be suitable for using the Likert scale responses? And then if you don't mind, I'm just gonna um, squeeze in another linked question, which was about, um, see if I can find the specific question, but it was, will we end up with a kind of row or a line of data per respondent per scale? And what will that look like when we start to implement the ASQ? Thanks so much, Rain, and thanks to everyone for asking these questions. That uh, I, I, I'm always keen to get more technical questions. Um, so in, I suppose, psychometrics, measurement science overall, um, we, we often think about the kinds of um, data that we generate that comes as a result of the kind of response scale that we use, the set of response options that we give people to use when they're responding to each individual item. What we have used across all items in the um, ASQ um, are Likert scale responses, which generate ordinal data. In other words, they generate data where we are roughly confident that the distance from each response to the next is overall stable or the same. Now, that's a sort of relatively vague assumption, but that's how that uh, uh, liquor response scales are, are generally constructed. To be clear, it's something that all of us have uh, are probably familiar with because it's answers such as strongly disagree, disagree, um, neither agree nor disagree, strongly agree, and then so on and so forth. Uh, we use a five point response scale for all of these items, which means that at the level of the item, the data is ordinal. But what we do is we use a factor analysis approach to essentially generate a factor score for each respective scale. Now, that factor score, without getting into all of the technicalities, is essentially a linear combination of the independent or individual responses on each constituent item. And although there is some wider debate in the literature, it is commonly uh, the case that these linear combinations of, of the individual responses making up what we call a factor score uh, often and most often gets treated as a continuous measure. So we have ordinal data at the level of the item, continuous data at the level of each respective scale, and you are very welcome to deploy your own factor analysis approach on the raw data, item-specific data that you collect to generate your factor score. If, however, you find yourself wanting simply an overall score for the scale that you have used from the ASQ, the spreadsheet that Rain mentioned will generate the score for you. All it asks you to do is to input the raw responses. Is it a four? Is it a five? Is it a two? Is it a one? Into a spreadsheet. It will then generate one single score to, de to two decimal points for each of your respondents, which you can then take and use in before and after analysis in whatever evaluation approach you are deploying in um, around your access or success initiative. Um, and the point there is that we then end up with essentially one overall score per um, scale. Now, if I may make a sort of a related point, Rain, which I don't think answers any of the questions, but I think underpins some of the, the discussion. We're not expecting, and indeed this is what we saw when the higher education providers tested these scales previously as part of the previous step. We are not expecting that anyone would use the totality, all of the ASQ scales at the same time. 
In fact, in the guidance around using the ASQ, uh, you highlight quite strongly that each individual institution or team should really focus on the outcome that makes most sense given the intervention that they are trying to evaluate. Hence, the uh, real relevance of TAPE, the Spectrum database, and other validated skills across um, the sector that are that might be relevant. So yes, we, we have the ASQ as a total questionnaire, but it is perfectly fine to use one scale, two scales, three scales, however many are relevant given the program. And within that, you then get your item-specific response and an overall continuous factor score for each respondent, which you can then put in any kind of analytical framework around your evaluation. Sorry, that was a longer answer, but I think it's kind of trying to get into the practicalities of using it. But again, just to say thank you to everyone asking these questions, because we will cover them in the frequently asked questions document that Rain mentioned, and hopefully that will um, provide even more clarity than we can do in this format. But just a very quick follow up, Sonia and Lauren, then I'm coming to you. But um, there's a question around the recommended time scale between pre and post distribution. Of course, this isn't specific to the ASQ, but no. perhaps you could just talk for a moment on that. So are we thinking test retest effect? So this is a, a sort of a common phenomenon in, um, again, something that measurement work and measurement science thinks about, and that is to what extent there is an element of salience or kind of um, remaining uh, memory of how individuals responded to a scale that then means that if we were to present them with the same scale immediately after, they would respond the same way simply because they've remembered what their previous answers had been. There is no, in my understanding, but people may differ, there is no rule of thumb as to what that uh, time lag should be. Um, we were lucky that in the uh, uh, data that we received from the higher education uh, um, providers that tested the val partially validated questionnaire last year, there was one that did a pre and post, um, and, and that was very interesting to see, and we did see uh, observe changes. I would say that if you're, you know, one day is probably too short, uh, one year is probably too long. And so you're looking at something in between. But And I know that that's not a specific answer. My answer would always be, it depends on the program that you are trying to evaluate. And if that makes, um, that drives your evaluation decisions and your, the measurement points, uh, that that's fine, um, as long as the, the two measurement points are not happening within the same day. Super, thank you. Um, Lauren, a question for you, I, I think, uh, around, so this is a question from Anthony, and what he's asking is, what's the reason or justification for excluding self-efficacy from the post-entry measurements of success? And he's suggesting that there's a ton of evidence to suggest that self-efficacy is a reliable psychological construct that correlates with success in higher education. Um, he then goes on to say that so unlike metacognition, um, self-efficacy is kind of domain specific. And the point he's making is by not including, well, I think the point he's making is by not including self-efficacy in one as one of the post-entry measures, are we really comparing apples and oranges? And do we have a full picture of what a student would need to be able to su succeed in higher education? So Lauren, I bounce that to you because you've obviously been enormously involved in the evidence review and understanding the kind of link between different outcomes and longer term success. But I also, and again, I'm sure you can speak to this, just wanted to note upfront that, um, we're absolutely not suggesting that self-efficacy should be excluded as a measure of post-entry success by any means. We had to make a bunch of prioritization decisions for the scales that we would focus on as part of this work, but we absolutely are not excluding it as an important outcome or construct. But Lauren, over to you. It's a really interesting question, Anthony. I mean, the first thing to say is that we, we did have to make decisions and choices um, and quite difficult decisions, right, about what outcomes we, we focus on within the access and success questionnaire. And that's why the evidence review and the, the engagement with the sector was so important. We Just to pick up on why we decided to include metacognition. So 
But we know that raising attainment is, is important for progression to university. So we and we have that we have that featured within the, the, the cognitive strategy scale. We also know that anything to do with cognitive development, cognitive ability is something which is developmental over time. And so having that metacognition scale um, once students then enter university really gives continuity in terms of the, the cognitive abilities and the cognitive outcomes. And we, I mean, there is a lot of evidence showing the effectiveness, you know, essentially anybody, right, whether they're in education, whether they're not, if they develop metacognitive skills and abilities, um, then they have better life outcomes overall. And this is, this is also within a, a higher education context as well. The, I mean, it's, it's kind of exclusion for the academics of efficacy was, I mean, partly it's driven by sort of a, a, a practical decision as well. But sort of when we look at the evidence across the board, it was particularly strong within a school context. And so we, and I suppose if we then kind of link it back to that practical point, we have to make sure we're getting students into university before they can then succeed at university. And so it, it felt particularly salient um, for for that access scale um, given all given all of the evidence um, from from school school based interventions um, and school students. Super, thank you. I, I also wanted um, to note, so there are a bunch of questions on the tape, which is a nice segue, and I'm going to come to that in a moment. Um, but the author of tape I've mentioned is someone called Matthew Horton. He works at Wolverhampton, and he is um, also in the early stages of scoping some work around a self-efficacy measure for post-entry. Um, so it's worth just um, for Anthony, but also anyone else interested, being aware of that. And I, I know Matt is... Matt Horton is very interested in this validation work and, and doing a lot of it. So um, I think it's a bit of a watch this space and a, and a plug for that. But I think we'll see more and more scales um, popping up over the sector in the, the coming weeks and months. Sonia, you were going to add something. Just to say that um, with with that, exactly as, as, as you're saying, Rain, I think it's really important to say that we are, again, highlighting the importance of validation as an overall uh, process, which is why when you go to the TESO website, to and and simply click on resources and the ASQ is there. There's a link on that page to tape. There's a link to the Spectrum database. There, um, there all these resources are all in the same place to allow everyone um, sort of immediate and quick access to them. And I'm sure that we will, um, we'll put that link. Well, TESO will put that link out there um, um, soon enough if it's well, it's already live. So it's all in one place. And I think the, the key thing for me is that, like Rain has said, this growing interest also means that there will also be growing awareness of how the scales have been validated before. So back to the earlier point around, you know, self-efficacy post entry into higher education. There's quite some, you know, a lot of work, really interesting work on 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 that and validated scales. But if you look deeply, you'll see that some of them are validated with very specific populations. They're validated in selected universities in the U.S., for instance. And we are what we were trying to do with the scales within the ASQ was really think about the whole the whole sector, which is why again you'll see that there are versions that are specific to higher education in a further education college setting within the ASQ, and that's not something that you can find in other validated uh, measures, but hopefully they will uh, soon arrive. Super, thank you. Um, so many questions to prioritize. I think I'm just gonna stick with tape for, for one moment and then we'll move on to a series of more technical questions that we have around um, analysis and how to use the scale. But just coming back to, to tape briefly, there are two things, um, a bunch of questions, I'm gonna group them into kind of themes. One is that, some people are asking um, kind of broadly, what's the difference between TAPE and the ASQ? What are the different outcomes and constructs that they measure? But the question I really want to address here is, can we use items from both? So can we take items from questions in TAPE and also take items from questions in the ASQ and combine them? And I think we should pick that up and address it. And then the second question I want to pick up on is a question of predictive validity. Um, maybe not everybody will understand immediately what predictive 
validity means, but it would be useful to just um, talk about predictive validity and how that relates to both the ASQ and um, TAPE as it's being asked. So two separate um, questions. Sonia, if I can come to you first on the question around combining items from different scales. Thank you, Rain. I would say you are very welcome to combine scales, but do not combine items. Um, so if, for instance, your work looks at increasing or looks to increase student motivation, which is something the ASQ does not include, then but also looks to inc uh, increase cognitive strategies in terms of, I don't know, around a particular subject, then by all means, use both scales. I think that that is absolutely the case. However, if you're interested in knowledge around higher education and you want to use item two from the ASQ scale and item five from the tape scale, I don't know that there is an item five. I'm just giving an, an example. Please do not. Uh, that invalidates the validation. Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. And then the second question here is around predictive validity. Um, and of course, we uh, no one on this call is the author of TAPE, um, so we can't accurately, and it's not our place to speak to the full process that TAPE has been through, but you can access TAPE via the TESO website. We very much recommend and welcome that you do that. There are useful scales that you can use in your evaluation in that toolkit. But Sonia, I wonder if, um, again, to come to you, you don't mind speaking to the predictive validity of the ASQ briefly. Of course. So this is what we had hoped to achieve at a much greater scale in, sen in the sense of exploring to what extent, once we have measured the intermediate outcome for each respective scale within the ASQ, we could then understand or see that that um, scale is then related, associated, statistically um, linked to a measure of later attainment, progression, or even a, a, a sort of attitudinal measure that comes later. Yeah, that is not an intermediate measure anymore, but is the uh, ultimate longer term outcome. Now, as you can start to see from what I'm suggesting is that that would have required us to wait for at least another year for that data to actually be collected in a way that um, allowed us for to, to, to do that analysis. Instead, what we are able to, to look at is a form of external and I suppose concurrent validity, looking at the relationship between the, each scale within the ASQ and external measures of attainment, but that have come before the collection of the measure within the ASQ. So the only difference, instead of having sort of a, a pure, purist perspective on predictive validity is that the measures of attainment that we are looking at, that again, the higher education providers who uh, deploy the partially validated questionnaire actually collected for us, and we are extremely thankful for that. Uh, we're able to look at essentially a range of GCSE measures, uh, English test scores, maths test scores, and, and things like that. And what we find, and this will again will be uh, out, outlined in the technical report that will be will come available in, in a short period of time, um, we find that the relationships are in the broad range of expected um, directions, definitely, so positive associations, and in the broad uh, kind of scope of the, the, the scale, the, the, the effect size, essentially how strong the magnitude of, of these relationships. Um, they are not extremely strong, but we wouldn't have uh, expected them to be extremely strong because we are not operating within a deterministic space. We're not saying that if it you know, age 16, your GCSE results were X, you are never going to be able to change your cognitive strategies. It's it's quite, it's literally the opposite of that. So so the analysis with external measures that we have we have done uh, informs us that we can be confident that there is a link in this in the scope, size and magnitude that we expected. Yes, absolutely. And to pick up on another very specific question, somebody is asking, are you going to be tracking respondents to establish the links with longer term outcomes? Um, it's very much linked to what Sonia is describing, and our hope is to do that. So the more that people use this consistent, these, these scales or the questionnaire measures consistently, um, and particularly through services like HEAT, the Higher Education Access Tracker, we will in time build a real kind of quality bank of data that we can track into things like UCAS or the HESA data set 
and look at the relationship or association between changes in something like cognition or metacognition and degree outcomes and entry to higher education. So um, the answer is one, yes, once we have a kind of wealth of data over the next year or two, there'll be all sorts of opportunities and not just for further looking at predictive validity, um, which is one important opportunity, but um, all kinds of kind of quasi experimental evaluation designs that we can use this data to understand the links between different intermediate and, and longer term outcomes. So there's a huge opportunity there um, and it's definitely on the horizon. Lauren, I'm going to come to you. We've still got so many questions and such little time, um, but somebody is asking, which sense of belonging scale would you recommend you use for first year students starting or students in registration for entering higher education? That is a good question. I think it depends on, um, and Sonia, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll have thoughts on this as well. I think it depends whether they've started university or not. If they are in that kind of in-between period, I would still use the pre-entry survey because they're not yet in that environment, in that context. Um, but as they enter through into university, um, you can then move to the post-entry sense of belonging survey. The, I mean, really the main difference between the, the sense of belonging pre and post surveys is about uh, whether the individual is, is in higher education already or whether it's their perspective on whether they think if they went to university, um, they would have a sense of belonging, they, they would fit in with, with the environment um, and with their peers and with others. And so it's it's probably a little bit of a grey area, there, but I would say that if they're, if they're not yet fully embedded within the institution, within the university, um, then you'd be best placed to use the, the pre-entry sense of belonging scale. Super, thank you, Lauren. Um, a quick question that I can take is somebody saying, sorry if I missed this, but are the TESO ASQ scales embedded in HEAT? And the answer to that is yes. So if you are a HEAT member, um, you can use each of the scales included in the ASQ via their survey platform. Um, then we've got a couple of questions on um, slightly more technical and on kind of tweaking the scales, basically, um, not quite analysis. The, the first one I'm going to take is a question from Jack, and Jack is asking, so we have some interventions that are geared towards specific degree types, so things like dentistry or medicine. What would your opinion be on adjusting the wording of some of the scales to reflect this? So, for example, I am confident that I can get the grades required to progress to medicine rather than to progress to higher education. Sonia, I'm going to bounce that to you initially, and then Lauren and I, we can jump in. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Rain, and thank you to, to the person asking the question. So this is where, you know, there's a strict answer that I would always give, which is please do not change the, the content of the, the words. Um, but then there's also the point about um, kind of re realizing and recognizing the fact that you might want to adapt things to your own context. So... I I am very, very strongly in favor of the first answer, which is keep the scales as consistent as it is possible. Please do not change prompts, response options, anything like that, because that will essentially mean that you're deploying a slightly different scale. But if the alternative to making tiny tweaks, especially when we're looking at um, kind of domain specific things like this example, instead of higher education using my medical course or my dentistry course or something like that. If the alternative to making small tweaks to the ASQ would be to generate something from scratch and not have any opportunity to test it prior to deployment, then make the small tweaks. And I think that's where this sort of answer around practicality uh, changes a little bit, but but I would err on the side of caution and, and stick with the same uh, scale overall. Just, just to come in briefly, I think the, the kind of the, the research answer, which is like, no, and then there's a practical answer, which is whether it means then there isn't a suitable um, scale or, or set of items, I think. And if it's in particular, I think when you're just tweaking, like, you know, as you say, we've got different versions for higher education versus university. I think that is more manageable. Um, but yeah, I suppose the headline is ideally no, but I think if if it's driven by situational factors in terms of like it's a particular subject or a, a different type of institution um then making small tweaks is, is better than not using it at all but it obviously it does it does shift the nature of what we've done in terms of the, the validation working and takes it slightly away from that 
um, yeah, there's definitely a research and a, and a practical answer within within that. Uh, absolutely, and to kind of come back to to why we're we're giving this sort of sort of relatively non-committal answer. When we did cognitive testing, um, and and you know there wasn't time to go through all of the detail, but we did do this in two separate stages. First with learners that were uh, above sixteen, and then with with learners in in year seven, particularly because we were looking at sort of making sure that the scales work with with younger um, learners and younger students. Um, and, you know, we really did spend time with them talking about the meaning of specific words, things like if you said exam versus test versus test scores versus results, those kinds of things actually mattered massively and meant different things to the group of very, especially the younger learners that we talked to. And it was on the basis of their responses and the feedback from uh, from the wider sector around the practicality of using this, that we actually settled on the kinds of uh, of, of 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 wording that we did eventually uh, settle on, um, and that's why you know I'm I'm apprehensive to say go and make small tweaks because that is the level of detail in which we went to um, in terms of determining each specific word as part of this, and which is why also the scales look different now to what they looked like. Um, not just in the partially validated questionnaire, but also in the original documentation and in the original sources that, that we looked at in the rapid evidence review, for instance. Thank you very much. I unfortunately am going to have to start wrapping us up. Um, but there are a couple of questions that I just want to speak to quickly, and then I will will absolutely wrap all of these up in our FAQ. So I'm so sorry if your question hasn't been answered. There's some really interesting questions still coming through, and I, I wish we had time, but we'll have to pick them up. Um, one thing I just do want to address. So we've got a question from someone saying some universities are too small to use heat and simply cannot afford it. Are you going to provide opportunities for small and specialist providers to contribute to this wider research pool slash project? Um, there's a few things to unpack there. The first thing to note and the headline is that we absolutely encourage anybody for whom these scales are useful to use them. They are not exclusive to certain organizations, providers, um, platforms, groups. They are open access, freely available on the Tezo website. Um, there is no kind of paywall or any barrier to being able to use access and implement these questionnaire scales. If they are useful and relevant to you and your context and the evaluation work that you're doing, then please do use them. You don't have to go through a membership organization. You can implement them directly in your work um, starting tomorrow, quite literally. So um, please do do that. The other thing to note is that we are encouraging um, all the trackers to use these scales. So we talk about HEAT today because HEAT have already implemented the ASQ scales into their platform and you can go if you are a heat member you can start using those scales through heat um but we are also um working with mrep and aim higher two of the other national trackers they're embedding the moat that i mentioned the mapping of activities and outcomes tool um, and they're also aware of this asq work that's going on and we generally encourage um everybody to kind of pick up and use it in a way that's useful as i said it's really available um so make use of it we then have a bunch of comments on kind of sharing resources. Where are the resources? Can we have a link? Will the slides be shared, et cetera? Just to reassure you that for everybody who signed up to attend this webinar, you will receive a recording of today um, with the slides. You will also receive links to every document that we have mentioned and referenced, including the EEF spectrum database and tape, um, and of course, all the, the Taser documents as well. So don't worry if you're struggling to find things, um, everything will be in your inbox shortly. Um, and then there's one other question, really running short on time now, that I just wanted to quickly address. So Dina is asking, how could we use the ASQ scales in the evaluation of our programs to report to the OFS specifically? Um, and the person is asking, the, the Access and Participation Plan, APP, monitors against quant target. So this is things like increasing a percentage of a certain demographic to access um, higher education and then it could be quite hard for them to direct to be able to measure kind of direct immediate impact of their interventions on these outcomes and the question broadly is does the ASQ help us would it be suitable so just to say um, specifically to Dina but also to anybody else in a similar position absolutely it is so if you want to understand um the percentage of learners from a care experience background who might be likely to 
to access higher education, you can use these proxy measures or intermediate outcomes. So things like what do they know about higher education? What's their academic self-efficacy? What are their cognitive strategies and abilities? Um, you can use these scales, implement it with a specific group of learners and understand whether or not they're moving in a kind of pre and post distance traveled closer to the likelihood of entering higher education. Um, I am going to have to close us off there, unfortunately, but just to reassure everyone that we'll pick up um, the questions in a frequently asked questions document. And then the other thing just to say is that there were a lot of questions that we didn't get to around um, kind of survey fatigue and how many questions I should include in a survey and what time of day should I ask a survey and how many students. It, it strikes me that a more general webinar on not just the ASQ, but like how to use and implement questionnaire scales would be useful um, and get at these questions, get at these answers of kind of survey fatigue and um, response rates. So I'll take that away as something to think about um, and maybe we run a, a separate webinar um, and follow up on that as well.